Hi, it's Scott Aberg from the Medical Evidence Blog, and I'm going to narrate this slideshow that I've given several times this year called There is No Evidence for That, Epistemic Problems in Critical Care Medicine. And epistemic is just a term uh, deriving from a branch of philosophy called epistemology, which is concerned with knowledge, its essence and origins, scope and validity, and limitations. And I'm going to talk then about uh, problems with uh, knowledge in critical care medicine. And what I want us to do is think about what it means uh, and the limitations of what it means when we say there is evidence for XYZ. Because if we say there is evidence for XYZ, it, it could mean that uh, there is evidence and it is valid evidence that XYZ is efficacious, but it could also mean that the evidence that we have is a false positive and it's insufficient for us to be basing decisions upon. Similarly, if we say there is no evidence for XYZ, it, it could mean that we simply don't have any formal evidence, but even in that case, uh, we may have reason to believe that a therapy is efficacious. Or it could be that we have formal evidence, but it is uh, it represents a false negative kind of uh, evidence that is likewise unreliable. I'd like to make a distinction between intelligence versus rationality, or better yet, book smarts versus common sense, which is a distinction which has intrigued me for some time, and which I finally found explicated in Rationality in the Reflective Mind, a book by cognitive psychologist Keith Stanovich. Book smarts is a product of the algorithmic mind, or the ability of the mind to act like a computer. And it is developed through the rote memorization of algorithms uh, which are uh, learned and can then be applied to problems which are identified through pattern recognition. That is, I recognize a pattern in which I can apply this algorithm to solve this problem. It is measured very precisely by IQ tests and it predicts success at calculus. Common sense is more related to rationality and cognitive psychologists describe two flavors of rationality. The first is epistemic rationality or how well a person's beliefs map onto reality. The second flavor is instrumental rationality, which is using those maps of reality from epistemic rationality to uh, make sound judgments and decisions to select and fulfill goals optimally. This kind of, uh, th this rationality or common sense is not measured at all by intelligence tests and is weakly correlated with all components of intelligence and Stanovich argues for a rationality quotient test uh, to measure it. Let me give you a medical example. Let's say that there's a very intelligent surgeon and he's very uh, talented and technically skilled and he is called about an 89 year old woman who has a large segment of ischemic bowel and perforation and who, who has multi-system organ failure and he elects to take her to the operating room to uh, resect the bowel and to try to get her back to the ICU alive. This is his goal even though the likelihood is that he will not achieve it or that even if he does achieve it she won't survive the ICU stay. This surgeon is perfectly rational as uh, if he uh, selects the right uh, operative techniques and fluids and anesthesia and achieves the goal of getting the patient back to the ICU even if she dies during the ICU stay. But many people would call him lacking in common sense because he quote misses the big picture. He's missing the big picture because he's artificially narrowly circumscribed his goals to the survival of the patient through the operation the technical success of the operation without complications. This narrow circumscription of goals uh, ign means that he has not conducted a rational search for all of the goals that people want to have satisfied when they have a medical problem such as <clears throat> avoidance of unnecessary costs and suffering and achievement of an outcome which represents a reasonable quality of life. This is to say if we have too narrow a uh, definition of our goals, we can be rational in the achievement of those narrow goals but be irrational overall because we have not reflected adequately on the whole host 
of goals that are competing with one another for our, uh, for our attention. In order to drive home further this notion of the difference between intelligence and common sense, I'll present the uh, ludic fallacy, which is a, a term coined by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, the author of The Black Swan, uh, and it derives from the Latin word ludos, meaning games, and he describes it as the misuse of games to model real-world problems. Let me give you an example. A fair coin is flipped and lands on heads 100 times in a row. What is the probability that it will land on heads on the next flip? Dr. John, the statistician, gives the rote textbook algorithmic answer. He says the coin has no memory of past flips, the flips are all independent, and thus the probability is 50%. Dr. John has book smarts. Tony, the options trader, is more of a street savvy kind of guy, and he has a different way of responding to this problem. He says that the probability that in my lifetime I will ever see a fair coin land 100 times in a row on heads is so low that I reject the premises. Either this coin is rigged or it hasn't actually landed 100 times on heads. Tony has common sense. And I bring this up because I think, and I will demonstrate through the rest of the presentation, that the way that we are doing evidence-based medicine represents on some levels a ludic fallacy. That is, we have a model, particularly a randomized controlled trial, that we are using to try to represent reality, and that model has numerous shortcomings which we glibly ignore, and oftentimes the problems that we are trying to study don't even lend themselves well to randomized controlled trials. Let's consider a situation in which we could legitimately say we have no evidence for something and no evidence condition. Uh, we might say that we have no evidence for parachutes for gravitational challenge, which harkens to a, a spoof article in British Medical Journal approximately 12 years ago. We can say that we have no evidence for mechanical ventilation uh, in terms of its benefit on mortality. No evidence for antibiotics for sepsis, intravenous fluids for dehydration, or insulin for di diabetic ketoacidosis. These situations were that we believe in that spite we have of not having evidence for these formal things, evidence, we certainly believe uh, that they share work. several things in common, and I call them category one therapies or parachute therapies. In these cases, the absolute risk reduction is high. There are visible and immediate effects. The causal pathways are obvious. Lack of insulin leads to DKA, provision of insulin, resolution of DKA. And trials are unethical uh, because there's no equipoise because of the high prior probability that the therapies are indeed efficacious. Contrast this uh, with these questions and ask whether or not we could answer these questions without formal evidence. The effic efficacy of two different brands of parachute. The dose of mechanical ventilation or oxygenation targets and mechanical ventilation. The duration or spectrum of antibiotics for sepsis, the dose or aggressiveness of fluids for uh, uh, intravenous fluids for resuscitation, or any tense of insulin therapy in the ICU. These uh, kind of questions also share something in, in common, and I would argue that in this case we can't have knowledge without formal evidence. These are what I call category two therapies, and they are characterized by smaller absolute risk reductions invisible and delayed effects such as statins for prevention of cardiovascular disease. In this landscape, associations are prevalent and causal pathways are obscure, such as ICU hyperglycemia leads to, uh, we don't know, it's associated with mortality, but we don't know if that's causal. And we can give insulin and correct hyperglycemia, but we don't know if that does anything to outcomes of interest such as mortality or other ICU uh, outcomes. In this category, trials are imperative and there is equipoise because of the lower prior probability of the alternative hypothesis. But there can be problems too with knowledge that is based on formal evidence. 10 or 15 years ago we thought we had evidence for intensive insulin therapy, for uh, early goal-directed therapy, for hypothermia after cardiac arrest, and for drotrocogen alpha and severe sepsis. So it is clear that uh, obtaining formal evidence does not necessarily give us knowledge which epistemologists consider to be a justified true belief. When we have formal evidence for a category uh, 2 therapy, we are in essence using, we 
obtain that evidence by using the trial of a diagnostic test of a hypothesis. And just like any other test where we have a certain cutoff and we say the disease is present or the disease is absent, the null hypothesis is uh, confirmed or the null hypothesis is rejected. If we have a positive trial, we, we say there is evidence for low tidal volume ventilation, for example. We can be basing that uh, declaration on a, a true positive study, but we can also have false positive studies. And these can uh, arise as a result of type 1 errors, which is basically a specificity issue and a related concept I'll talk about that I call the alphabet. It can result from all of the biases that you hear in journal clubs, trials stopped early for benefits, single center trials, a lack of blinded adjudication, post hoc adjustments, adjustments to the protocol, so on and so forth. And uh, what Ioannidis calls flexibility, any flexibility that is in the design or conduct or analysis of the, of the trial allows conscious or up unconscious biases of investigators to surface in the way that the data are recorded, uh, generated, or presented, or analyzed. It's also important to recognize, and we've seen this uh, much more uh, commonly recently uh, with especially this popular website Retraction Watch, is that some data can just be frankly fraudulent, and you can build an entire career, career upon fraudulent data. And there's another issue that I talk about for several slides, which I call stochastic dominance of the null hypothesis, which is just borrowing a term from decision therapy, uh, theory and a choice that has stochastic dominance is one which is the best bet. So in essence, I'm saying in a fancy way that the null hypothesis is the best bet. Alternatively, if we have trials that are negative, we can have true negative trials, which may just simply result from stochastic dominance of the null hypothesis. It's just the best bet and the landscape, the prior probability when you're answering any question or trialing uh, any therapy is that it's most likely that it doesn't work and we don't have a way of knowing the uh, overall prior probability of the null and alternative hypothesis but it's quite possible that that landscape is populated most densely with null hypotheses. But if the trial is negative, we can also have false negatives, and these can result from type 2 errors, which is basically a specificity, or a sensitivity issue, I should say, uh, or from, uh, uh, and these can result from inadequate study power or from a concept which I will introduce called delta inflation. And these are some of the many reasons why John Ioannidis says that most published research findings are false in this widely cited and discussed PLOS One article. This notion, notion of false positive uh, evidence in critical care has become apparent to us over the last 10 years, and it was about 10 years ago that Ioannidis uh, published in JAMA in 2005 this article describing how highly cited clinical research uh, was often contradicted when attempts were made to replicate it, or that the effects that were found on replication were much smaller than those that were uh, originally reported. This has been called various different things, uh, most notably the decline effect. Fortunately, we have now, as of August of this year, the most uh, extensive empirical demonstration of the decline effect or the lack of reproducibility of research results uh, which was performed by the Open Science uh, Collaboration, the Center for Open Science. And what they did is canvassed s the top four psychology journals over a defined period of time and found 100 positive studies and then sought to replicate them both by using the original methods as reported by the authors in the original manuscript but also by contacting and collaborating when possible with the original authors so that some nuances that weren't originally reported or the notes that they had or their recollections of how they conducted the experiment wouldn't be lost uh, when the trial was attempted to be replicated. And it's an astonishing result that they found and one which it should be shocking to everyone doing science even though it's uncertain whether or not these results from the psychological literature are generalizable to other fields such as medicine, although I certainly believe that they are. They found that only of the 100 studies that they attempted to replicate, they could replicate them at the statistical uh, significance level only 36 out of 100 times, meaning that two-thirds of the studies weren't replicable.
Here is the figure one from that article showing the a density plot of the p-values from the original studies, which are here. They're all under this horizontal line representing 0.05. Indeed, three of the studies were considered positive even though they, they were basically allowed to squeak by with p-values slightly greater than, uh, than 0.05. And you can see that they're all clustered down here near zero. Uh, on replication, the density plot was far more diffuse so that you can see that even if you had a very low p-value to begin with, such as over here, you oftentimes had these very large p-values approaching one when you attempted to replicate the study. Here's figure two from that article showing the original study p-values here. Of course, most uh, all of them are below 0.05 and down to zero, and it shows the replication uh, p-values on the uh, vertical axis, the y-axis here. And you can see as uh, has become uh, familiar to us in medicine that when you have a marginal p-value, it's likely that when you repeat it, you get these much higher p-values, as high as 0.8. But what's a little bit more surprising is that even when you have what's considered to be a statistically robust result, such as 0.01 or even less, you get these repeat p-values up here that come as high as 1. Now here's the area that's of particular interest and it's from 0.005 down to 0 and that's in this blow up figure here and you can see that even if with very small p-values converging on 0 you do have a lot of replicability down here with these infinitesimally small p-values but you also have and it appears to be a, a coin toss these replication studies with much higher p-values This shows effect size and the decline effect, as I previously mentioned, with effect size. This is the original effect size, again, on the uh, x-axis and the replication effect size on the y-axis. And you can see here, this is a unity line, which shows where that the original equals the replication effect, and this line is the zero effect, so that if the dots fall below the horizontal dashed line, it means that the repeat study effect went in the opposite direction as the original. Blue dots here are significant studies, pink ones are non-significant, and notice here that the, the blue dots do appear to be scattered somewhat symmetrically across the unity line, which does suggest that these are true positive results, and you're just as likely on repetition to get a bigger effect as you are on rep repetition to get a smaller effect. The uh, non-significant trials though, you are have about a third of the time you actually get an effect that goes in the wrong direction. This is the uh, density plot of the replication uh, if effect sizes here for the negative studies and the positive studies and the effect sizes of the positive studies and the uh, studies with uh, uh, smaller uh, the marginal p-values up here for the original effect sizes. So now having given several examples of how in medicine and critical care in particular we have learned that it's difficult to replicate our findings and oftentimes they're much smaller and not significant when we attempt to and this large empirical cohort from the Center for Open Science it's, it's now time to uh, consider why we might be having false positives and why we can't replicate our studies and I'm going to argue that a large part of it is what I call the alphabet and the alphabet is our bet on what alpha value or, or what a p value will allow us to reliably discriminate between uh, true effects and those which are accruing due to chance alone. Most people don't know how arbitrary and capricious the conventional threshold of 0 0.05 for the uh, significance level is. And this convention was established by Sir R.A. Fisher of Fisher's exact fame in a textbook in 1925 that he published called Statistical Methods for Research Workers. And it's important to recognize that Fisher was considering 90 years ago a threshold for the science of that era, which was experiments such as frog legs bathed in ringer solution, studying action potentials. There was a handful of people at most on the earth studying this at any given time, and the study cost was peanuts. Let's fast forward to how that we are using this convention now 90 years later. Our study population could be tens of thousands of patients with coronary disease. Uh, the outcome could be death or non-fatal MI. There are hundreds, if perhaps even thousands, of investigators on the face of the earth studying this same problem, and study costs can run into the tens of millions of dollars.
yet we're still using a 90 year old p-value. So if we're going to use this uh, conventional statistical significance threshold that may be anachronistic or outdated, uh, I think it's important to look at Fisher's uh, exact original words, and here they are from that 1925 textbook. Quote, the value for which p equals 0 0.05 or 1 in 20 is 1.96 or nearly 2, and it's convenient to take this point as a limit in judging whether a deviation ought to be considered significant or not. Using this criterion, we should be led to follow up a false indication only once in every 22 trials even if the statistics were the only guide available. A couple of pages later, quote, if one in 20 doesn't seem high enough odds, we may, if we prefer, draw the line at one in 50 or one in 100. Personally, the writer prefers to set a low standard of significance at the 5% point and ignore entirely all results which fail to reach this level. A scientific fact should be regarded as experimentally established only if a properly designed experiment rarely fails to give this level of significance. Notice the areas where I've put emphasis. He says, even if the statistics were the only guide available. And notice how we do it now. We have this algorithmic approach and we conduct a randomized controlled trial and we declare victory if the p-value is less than 0.05. It appears through his words that Fisher is suggesting a more holistic approach to hypothesis testing and uh, the, the uh, analysis of evidence. And he also says that he admits that he's setting a low threshold, a low standard, a lax one, and that you should only accept it if a properly designed experiment rarely fails to give this level of significance. To continue from the last slide, I would say that it's pretty clear that Fisher would not say that any of the critical care trials that I highlighted on our previous slides, such as intensive insulin therapy or hypothermia after cardiac arrest, have met his condition of rarely failing to give that level of significance. But let's segue to this next concept, stochastic dominance of the null hypothesis, or the idea that the null hypothesis is the best bet. And to demonstrate this in a way that's poignant to practitioners of critical care, I'll use the ARDSNET population of studies. So we can ignore the nuances of any of the, each of these studies and com uh, compile them together as a cohort or a population because they are all the same disease, mainly the same investigators using the, the best state of knowledge when they design the trial that, that suggests that there might be equipoise regarding those therapies. And we have, as you're aware, Karma, Armour, Lazarus, Fact, Alveoli, Alton, Eden, Alta, Eden, Omega, and Sales. And the only one of these trials in which the null hypothesis was rejected is, of course, RMR low tidal volume ventilation. So this population of hypotheses is clearly dominated by the null hypothesis, which is not rejected 90% of the time. It, the implications of the stochastic dominance of the null hypothesis can be demonstrated well with this nomogram, which is a, uh, from a report by a, a, a Swiss statistician named Held, and he calls it a nomogram for p-values. And it's a way of using whatever we estimate the prior probability as uh, to modify that using the results of, with, of frequentist data or a p-value to try to arrive at a, at a posterior probability of the null or the alternative hypothesis. Here on this side, on the left side, we have the prior probability of the, the null hypothesis. So here, 50-50, null and alternative are both 50%. And if the prior probability is 90 here, then the prior pro of, the, of the null, then the prior probability of the alternative will be 10%. Here are p-values in the center. On this side, we have the minimum posterior probability of the uh, null hypothesis. And one minus this value is the maximum posterior probability of the alternative. Let me show you by an example and walk you through. If we th think that we have a 50-50 chance, which oftentimes this is considered to be equipoise. We think that because we have equipoise, there's a 50% probability of the alternative hypothesis. And as I think I demonstrated the ARSNET studies, it's actually a good deal lower than that. But let's say that the alternative hypothesis is thought to have a probability of 50%, and we get a p-value of 0 0.049, let's say, then the maximum posterior probability of the alternative hypothesis is approximately 72%, which is not bad. That's still a relatively high probability, but it's much less than people intuitively think. If, on the other hand, we have a very robust result, as some of the Center for Open Science results uh, showed that we're converging upon zero, 
then we have a maximum posterior probability of the alternative hypothesis of 98%. That is 1 minus uh, 1 100% minus 2% equals 98%. Now that's a relatively robust result. But what happens if, like the ARDSNET studies, the prior probability of an ARDSNET hypothesis is much lower, and it's on the, the alternative hypothesis the probability is on the order of 10%. Well, now we're off the chart. And the posterior, the maximum posterior probability of the alternative hypothesis is something like on the order of 25%. If we have a much more statistically robust result, however, with a p-value of 0.01, the maximum posterior probability of the alternative hypothesis, that is that the therapy works, is on the order of 85%. Now we're talking, because 85% is probably a value that we could confidently base treatment decisions upon. Carl Sagan was fond of saying extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And because we overestimate the prior probability of our alternative hypothesis, that is that we're overly optimistic. We say we have this preliminary data, we have uh, laboratory data, we have reason to believe this, we have biological plausibility, we have animal experiments. We tend to think that by the time we get to a phase three trial, that we have a high probability, something like on the order of 50% of the alternative hypothesis. And it's actually a more extraordinary claim than that, as I've demonstrated. Uh, and so in order to get to a threshold and uh, where that we can base decisions upon when our prior probability is low, 0.05 doesn't cut it, 0.01 doesn't cut it. When we get to 0 0.001, we finally get to posterior probabilities which are high enough that we can probably uh, confidently base decisions upon even if they're not over 95 or 99%. Now the reason I've talked about the alphabet and stochastic dominance of the null hypothesis is because the two of them combined is probably uh, explains a large proportion of our failures to repeat initially promising studies such as intensive insulin therapy, Zygris early goal directed therapy, and hypothermia after cardiac arrest. I'd like to segue and talk uh, for a couple of slides about false negatives. And in a paradigm-shifting article published in the New England Journal in 1978, Freeman et al. Uh, report a survey of 71 negative trials. And these authors noted that oftentimes trials were being published that were quite small and had negative results. And in many cases, the authors were making claims such as that the failure to reject the null hypothesis in their data set meant that there was no difference between the two treatment groups. But oftentimes, uh, in this day, prior to, the, prior to this article, uh, many times just convenient sample sizes were chosen arbitrarily by authors, such as just 50 patients in, in each group. And these uh, authors, Freeman et al., uh, demonstrated the importance of uh, type 2 error rate and uh, beta and, of course, uh, power in, in uh, defining a sample size for your trial such that you could make statements about both the null and the alternative hypothesis. And this is, a, a come, they didn't invent this, but they reported it most prominently and it's become known as double significance hypothesis testing. And the point of calculating uh, power and sample size a priori in this way is to avoid uh, studies which are too small to discriminate a difference between the, the two groups uh, and uh, which makes you have little confidence that uh, if the alternative hypothesis were in fact correct you would have found a difference. So you can see that I'm setting up a guide or a recipe for how to cook up a randomized controlled trial. And what ought to be is that we select a type 1 error rate based on the risks of a false positive, and that might be different depending upon what therapy we are trying and uh, trialing and uh, for what uh, disease. But what we do is we use this alphabet, this 0 0.05 by the convention established by Fisher 90 years ago. What we ought to do is select a type 2 error rate, according to Freeman et al., uh, based on the risk of a false negative trial, but what we really do is we set 
we just set power on either side of 80% because that's what gets us into a top journal. We're supposed to estimate, estimate the uh, baseline event rate in each group, and that's basically what we do. And uh, if we are going to do double significance hypothesis testing, as Freeman et al. suggested we, we, we should, uh, we need to estimate the a realistic treatment effect size of the therapy, or what is it? How much is it going to influence the outcome of the treatment group? Uh, and we should base this on uh, preliminary data, or historic data, or some kind of precedent. And what my colleagues and I realized several years ago that is probably happening is that people, because of or investigators, because of financial restraints time limitations, uh, patient uh, accrual, and all of sorts of logistical difficulties. We're actually just thinking how many patients is it feasible to enroll and then uh, back calculating a delta or a uh, effect size, a, a treatment effect from this number. So they were basically doing power calculations in reverse. So. Uh, we thought that delta was being inflated and that this represents a bias in the design of uh, randomized controlled trials in critical care. Delta inflation is the research as great inflation is to academics. If you're at Harvard and there's great inflation and you have a B, you're probably a C student. And uh, in the current uh, landscape of critical care, if you say that your power is 80%, it's probably more like 30 or 40%. And here's why delta is so rife for manipulation. In the standard scenario with P equals 0.05 power 90%, you need a and delta of 10%, let's say, which is a commonly used number, you need 1,100 patients. If you relax alpha to 0.1, you need 884. If you relax power to 80%, you need 816. If you fudge the baseline mortality in either direction because it's kind of a uh, nebulous thing anyway and most people won't give you too much grief about that, it's still 992. But if you, instead of using a 10% delta or absolute risk reduction, you inflate it to 15%, you reduce by about 55% a dramatic reduction in the number of patients that you need to enroll. This is the main figure from our article and what we did uh, for to uh, get a cohort of studies in meta-research fashion, just like the Center for Open Science Collaboration did, is we canvassed the uh, top five general medical journals in terms of impact factor, New England Journal, JAMA, British Medical Journal, Lancet, and Annals of Internal Medicine. And we uh, canvassed them over a 10-year period from approximately 2000 until 2010. And we looked for every uh, trial of, for of, uh, critical care therapy in uh, adults that used proportional mortality as a primary outcome so that we had a homogeneous uh, uh, cohort of studies. And in this gr uh, figure, which is somewhat analogous to the Center for Open Science, but it's uh, slightly different, we have the predicted delta, or the uh, difference between the treatment and the placebo groups, the authors reported the method section that they were looking for on this axis. And that's why you see here at 10%, this is 10% right here, at 10% you have a whole cluster of them because that's a nice convenient number and it yields uh, a sample size required of approximately 1,000 patients. On this axis we have the observed delta, that is what did they actually find uh, in, in, the, in the resulting data. And this blue line is a unity line, and if a point estimate falls on, on this line, that means that they were perfectly calibrated and they perfectly predicted the, the observed uh, delta with, with their, uh, the, the delta that they use for power calculations. Point estimates are green dots with associated 95% confidence intervals if it's a negative trial, and red triangles if it is a positive trial, which of course then those 95% confidence intervals don't cross zero here. And in addition to the fact that so many of them are clustered here around 10%, you can find some other things which uh, on reflection are probably obvious. This is the safe trial here, 6,000 patients. They looked for a much smaller, I think 3% was their predicted delta that they were looking for. So they get a much narrower and precise confidence interval compared to some of these trials up here that looked for 20%. They have a, a larger, uh, actually smaller sample sizes, so they have much wider confidence intervals. You'll also notice that many of the confidence intervals, 95% confidence intervals, don't even cross the uh, uh, predicted delta here. And 
So in effect, the 95% confidence intervals of the data, and this, 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 these trials excluded the predicted delta that they were looking for. But the most important thing uh, about this uh, figure is that there's bias. In only two cases, the Bernard study of Zygris and the River study of early goal-directed therapy, did the point estimate for delta uh, exceed the predicted delta. In 36 of 38 of the total trials, they fell short of delta, so there's clearly a bias here. Uh, they are not accurately estimating delta. They're figuring out how many patients they can enroll and saying uh, that delta is a number that uh, comports with the sample size that they wish to enroll. Note also that the two trials that did exceed the predicted delta have not been uh, uh, reliably replicable. Delta inflation then is a systematic overestimation of delta. The mean predicted was 10, the mean observed is 1.4. Only five of the 38 trials provided justification for delta, uh, which they should optimally do. Uh, and, but of course, the justification is our logistical constraints. Uh, in 26 of the 38 of the trials, the 95% confidence interval excluded the predicted delta. So if they were looking for a clini clinically meaningful effect, then they excluded that. But the fact that this is the same outcome, short-term proportional mortality in the ICU, argues against the notion that they are using minimal clinically important difference to guide this choice because you can't say that in one study a minimal clinically important difference is 3% and in another study it's 20% because this is the same outcome. So that argument doesn't hold water. In conclusion, uh, I, I would like to Reemphasize that knowledge is indeed based upon evidence, but evidence can come in many forms and is not limited to formal evidence from randomized controlled trials. Randomized controlled trials themselves can be highly fallible, especially when used in kind of a, a uh, boilerplate or cookbook uh, kind of fashion. And they can have false positives and false negatives because of the limitations inherent in the models as we use them and because so much of what we're doing is based on convention, much of which is anachronistic and outdated. So things such as the alphabet uh, and uh, subversion of double significance hypothesis testing with delta inflation can lead us to have unreliable trials and our failure to recognize the important implications of Bayes' theorem and stochastic dominance of the null hypothesis also can lead us to be confused and scratching our heads when our trials are completed and we can't replicate them. An algorithmic or cookbook interpretation of randomized controlled trials can lead to erroneous conclusions because how much of what is in this uh, presentation, which can be well supported and documented with both logic and, uh, and evidence, is uh, taught in the user's guide to the medical literature. None of it. Absolutely none of it. And an algorithmic or cookbook design of randomized controlled trials can lead to erroneous conclusions. Uh, for example, just using the standard values for alpha and, uh, and, and beta and, and, and delta. I think Buddha said it best, believe nothing, no matter where you read it or who has said it, not even if I have said it, unless it agrees with your own reason and your own common sense. I uh, appreciate your atten attention for uh, an interest in, in this slideshow uh, and, uh, uh, and for your coming to the medical evidence blog.